so we're going to go to the next section. All right. Um, so um, he says then that the first languages were a mixture of speech and signs, words and actions. So he's really, in fact, then bringing us back to these early languages and saying that not only, you know, not only does the Bible use figures of speech in order to um, tell us how language originated, these figures of speech are also embedded in the very origin of language, right? Um, so he says here, language as appears both from the records of antiquity and the nature of the thing was at first extremely rude, narrow, and equivocal. This is the very first sentence that, um, <coughs> of the passage that you're supposed to read, and at the end of that equivocal there was that long footnote, right? But we're going to continue now. So that men would be perpetually at a loss on any new conception or uncommon adventure to explain themselves intelligibly to one another. This would naturally set them upon supplying the deficiencies of speech by apt and significant signs. Accordingly, in the first ages of the world, mutual converse was upheld by a mixed discourse of words and actions. Hence came the Eastern phrase of the voice of the sign. Right? So he's saying that signs, which is to say, you know, not language, but sort of you know, images, um, were necessary for communication because the, the, the early kinds of language were very crude and, uh, and, 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 and equivocal. They, you know, the, they weren't very clear, right? Uh, and so, th so the earliest humans, they needed these, these signs to make their meaning clear. And what's interesting here is that um, he's describing this sort of primitive type of language uh, in which um, you need to supplement with signs. And, and it's really kind of, in a sense, similar. I'm saying that it's similar to what we, we saw with, with Kanzi. Remember the, the ape that we saw? Uh, and the problem that Kanzi has is that he can't um, vocalize language the way humans can. He doesn't have the vocal cords to do it. Um, and so he needs these signs. He, needs, he needed that, um, that keyboard with the different signs in order to help him um, to communicate without using, without using speech, right? So in a sense, uh, Warburton is kind of describing that same situation where, you know, the vocal cords, somehow the speech is not adequate and you need this addition of signs in order to make things clear, right? Um, so, you know, obviously he's not talking directly about cancer, but he is talking about this kind of situation of a kind of deficient speech or a sort of primitive kind of speech um, in which you need signs in order to supplement. And so I, wanted, I just want you to kind of keep that in mind as we go through the course that there's this aspect in which um, signs are really important perhaps um, in this early stage of language development. Right? So now um, <coughs> the next thing that he moves on to then is how these signs continue to be used after that origin of language. And here is an example of how um, Warren, uh, Warburton um, really lays out his argument in a very careful way um, the, in which the claim, reason, evidence, and warrant are, are all right in back of each other and laid out for everybody to see. Okay? And so I'm giving you a, a, a real strong hint for those of you writing your, your essays on Warburton about you know, how you would do this. right? Uh, but but I'm, I'm giving you the hint because you're the first one, you know, uh, this is the first one you're all doing and, uh, and Warburton's hard. Okay, so, so we're going to go through this passage carefully uh, to kind of figure out how, how he's doing this. All right, and so um, first, um, well, okay, let me just read this first part where, where he has the claim, right? Um, and use and custom, as in most other circumstances of life, improving what arose out of necessity into ornament, this practice subsisted long after the necessity has ceased. Right? Um, so he's saying that this practice, that it's actually from, from the previous paragraph that we just read, uh, of a mixed discourse of words and actions, right? sort of both speech and images, right? um, uh, this practice of using that mixture continued long after the need for it uh, was no longer there, right? That's his claim, that, that, that people still use these, these types of images, these figures of speech, these um, what he calls um, uh, mixed discourse of words and actions, even though it's not necessary, right? That's the claim. And then he says, especially amongst the Eastern people, those natural, th whose natural temperature inclined them to a mode of conversation, which so well exercised their vivacity by motion, and so much gratified it by a perpetual representation of material images. And that's the reason, right? And, and I'm saying here that the reason is, so why, you know, why should um, 
people still use these, these types of images. And he's saying that these Eastern people, I mean, he's kind of referring to the people that are described in the Bible, right? Um, we're kind of, for Europe, it's East, right? Uh, they were so well exercised by their, uh, so well exercised their vivacity by motion. So they, they're, they're vivacious people. They're lively people. <laughs> they, they move around a lot, right? Um, and, and they're gratified by this motion by a perpetual representation of material images. So there's a, there's a sense in which these material images add a kind of vivacity to their language, a kind of liveliness to their language. And that's what he's emphasizing. This, I guess you could say it's, you know, Hobbes would have called it ornamental, I suppose, um, but he's calling it um, this kind of vivacity of motion that lends speech a kind of, um, yeah, I guess a kind of excitement, a kind of urgency, right? And that's what he sees here as useful in figures of speech, right? And, and that's why they, they, they continue to exist, right? So that's the reason. That's what I'm saying, right? Of this, we have innumerable um, instances in Holy Scripture. So then he, he immediately tells us, ah, here are some instances, here is some evidence, here are some examples of what I'm talking about. Um, and then so he gives these examples of different prophets and how they speak or how they use um, not speech, but they, how they use actions or images, right? And he says, where the false prophet pushed with horns of iron to denote the entire overthrow of the Syrians. So that, and he's referring to some prophet, I don't even know which one, which one, who somehow used these horns of iron, just kind of pushed the horns of iron, and, and instead of saying something, sort of pushed the horns of iron in order to, to demonstrate the overthrow of the Syrians, right? So that's one image, right? It's like an action that this person carried out um, in order to communicate. And then he has these ex another example, where Jeremiah, by God's direction, hides the linen girdle in the hole of the rock near Euphrates, where he breaks a potter's vessel inside of the people, puts on bonds and yokes, and casts a book into Euphrates. So these are all things that, that Jeremiah does, right? Hiding this girdle, he breaks this potter's vessel, puts on bonds and yokes, and casts a book into the Euphrates River, right? So he does these things. He doesn't speak, but rather he, um, he, he carries out these actions in order to make a point. Right? And so the key is that you, know, you, you, you can make the point better if you're able then to carry out these actions that kind of impress upon somebody you know, what's going on and, and rather than just saying it to somebody. Um, finally, he's got Ezekiel, by the same appointment, delineates the siege of Jerusalem on a tile, weighs the hair of his beard in balances, carries out his household stuff, and joins together the two sticks for Judah and Israel. So again, these are actions that this, this prophet carries out um, in order to illustrate a point. Right? Um, and so these are all the examples of how these, these actions um, are, are useful as a supplement to speech in order to make a point. And finally, right after that, he, does ha he has his warrant. He says, by these actions, the prophets instructed the people in the will of God and conversed with them in signs. Right? And so he's saying that these actions, we can interpret them, or we can interpret this evidence as ways in which prophets are able then to better instruct people in the will of God, right? Instruct the people and converse with them in signs and are able to then, in a sense he's saying that they're able to communicate better with people by using these types of images um, rather than just using kind of prosaic literal speech. Yeah? Um, so, on the one hand, I think it's very clearly laid out in this passage. I mean, you can kind of read carefully to see what's going on, and then we can, see, we can identify all these, these, these elements of the argument. On the other hand, it's also, you know, what I'm doing is also a process of interpretation, right? And I, I'm, I'm taking each of these sections where he's saying something, and I'm interpreting it this, this means this, this means this, this means this. And this is what you're going to be doing in your essays, right? You're going to be, you'll be looking at the passages, you can quote the passages, but then you need to give in your own words, well, how is this the reason? What is, how do we sum that up as a reason? How do we sum that up as a warrant? How, does, how do the, all these different pieces fit together to make up the whole argument? Right? So I've, given, I'm, I mean, I've basically given you the answer to this. And you, you, can, you can write it all out and you can turn it and you can get a good grade on this, um, on this assignment. Okay? Um, but you have to do it in your own words. Right? So you, you have to kind of lay it out yourself. Right? Um, but you know, based on what I'm telling you is fine. Right? 